Thank you. Okay, so who here, uh, let's actually just start with a question. Who here is here because they want to learn about lookup tables with FPGAs? Ooh, who's here to learn, want, wants to learn about lookup tables inside of microcontrollers and how to make them do some crazy things? Okay, I, at least they got kind of the right room here. So I'm Charles, I have a YouTube channel. I haven't actually posted anything in a while because of a recent job change. Uh, it's, it's, I really just love exploring the physical phenomenon and all sorts of crazy things and making things do what they really shouldn't do. And the most powerful tool, technical tool, there are other tools like using Google and stuff like that, but the most powerful technical specific engineering tool that I do, that I use to, to do these crazy things are lookup tables, which seems so odd because it's not like a course you take in school, but it's it's literally the thing that, that takes problems which would be impossible and makes them solvable in reasonable amounts of time. And I'm kind of talking about stuff like this. This is a logarithm lookup table. Um, and people have been doing this sort of stuff since like 500, I think, was the first published mathematical lookup table, like AD 500. And uh, so we're going to look at, uh, start to try to mix the paradigms that are in FPGAs and processors. So this means kind of leaving the whole sort of, I think about it in code and snake around way, and think about it more in the FPGA sort of like link it all together, shove it into a block, and make it happen all at once way. We're going to kind of just do this because we want to combine hardware. We, if we have a whole bunch of bodge wires and a whole bunch of components all jammed together, each one of these things has baggage with it. And the fewer components you have, the better and more reliable your design is probably going to be in the end because it's less points of failure. And so that's one of the reasons I've always kind of been drawn towards this sort of thing. Because microcontrollers, my favorite ones, have Wi-Fi. And uh, a lot of times, they, they have the right mix of stuff that you want. And just sometimes they can't do the job. And you're like, I, I really need an FPGA. And that's where I've been time and time again until I was like, oh, I guess I actually don't need an FPGA. Because, as one of my previous coworkers said, it's a hardware problem, but we can fix it in software. And that's kind of a mentality I've really taken to the bank. So you guys have probably seen lookup tables before. You've probably heard about them for things like maybe color space conversion, or you've probably seen palettes, like the, the Hackaday Supercon badge this year with the, uh, the logo where it has that animated sort of like exploding out thing going on. That's just a glorified lookup table because you just have these colors on the screen which just get remapped. So when you're going through, you just decide the color to display based off of a palette. A lot of times, you guys might have heard about using lookup tables to compute sine or cosine uh, in like a microcontroller, because for these transcendental functions are going to be crazy to try to compute on the fly, but you don't need to. You can just store the value and look it up. And other image processing things, that sort of stuff is common. Some of the more unusual ones, though, are CRC computation, which you've probably noticed if you've ever looked at CRC code. There's this table that somehow snakes around and does the right stuff. And one of the more interesting ones I found out recently was ZLib. So this, this compression algorithm, the same thing it's used with like tar, gzip, and everything, I think, except for .zip files, or maybe even, does anybody know if .zip files use that? I don't, I don't even know. OK, probably not. Um, but that algorithm, there used to be dedicated hardware in some processors to actually decompressing this stuff. Like they would include specialty hardware in these systems. But it turns out, some guy figured out, oh, actually, I can just use a lookup table to do eight bits at a time. And then it turned out, actually, then the software solution was faster than any of the hardware that had been built to begin with. And so that was the end of that hardware. And the last part that I really kind of want to get into is more of the nasty logic. So we can start by looking at some real world lookup tables. So this is, uh, this is something I found out about actually like four days ago was that uh, Astro Navigation, what they actually have is just tables for when they get out the sextant, sextant and they look at a star, they look it up in the table to figure out based on the time where they would be in a circle in one area. You do it through a couple stars and then now you know where you are. Uh, things like the Winter Garden, if you've ever seen the Magic Marble Machine, the thing has a big drum which stores kind of uh, information about the song that would be being played. Uh, concordances and slide rules, and one of the more interesting ones I thought were cams. So in the way back when, when, when we were having these battleships that needed to shoot these shells a really long way, really precisely, they had these targeting computers that just baked in transcendental functions into just these literal like wheels where it would just be a pin that would give you the answer of what this 
hugely complicated like mathematical thing was just by like turning the knobs to the right places. And one of the cooler ones that I like is this from the um, I'm trying to remember what it was called, the Long Now. That's right, yeah, the Long Now machine because it's actually like a two-dimensional lookup table where you have this like rotation and where you're reading it, and that determines some of these astrological uh, like values. So. If you guys know the right terms for these things that I'm going to be covering, please contact me. Please tell me. Please tell me after the conference, hey, you're totally wrong. Because I want to know. I've been Googling this. I cannot find any like actual definition for these different principles. So I just made up some words. And they are the idea of having a tome for a lookup table, using process algebra in lookup tables, this thing called switch case syndrome, which apparently that's actually what that name is called. Other people use it, so that one might be real. This idea of naive automaton, or a Chinese room, a philosophical Chinese room and logic hiding and that's that's kind of the coolest one I think so the first one let's go like back to the start here we have tomes if you have a multiplication table you don't need to multiply you just look up in the table for the two values and now you have your answer and uh, you can do interesting things like count the number of one bits in a value. And this is useful for things like trying to figure out like, well, how, what is the value of this thing if I get a PDM signal coming in or, or any of these other kind of weird things where you want to count the ones. And by the way, there's other kind of neat algorithms where if you can do this quickly, you can do neat things like zigzag through 2D arrays and stuff like that. And this is an example from the Stanford Bit Twiddling uh, Hacks website. And it's the first example on how to do this. So you know it's terrible. And for this, what it does is it steps through and it counts the number of ones that you see in this, this thing right here. And so it would iterate through for every single bit. It's got to go run that loop, do the comparison, or an AND operator, or a plus. Tons of stuff. This thing is hugely slow. But if you look a little bit further down on the Stanford Twitter, bit twiddling hack site, they have this example, where they use some macros, don't worry about that. But it produces this table where for every possible 8-bit value, you have the answer of how many ones are in that message. Now, the real power here comes when you start mixing these tables, when you can decompose your, your, your table into, or the, the, the task into smaller pieces. So if you want to say do this, but for 32 bits, you can just simply look up the top nibble, add it to the next nibble, or top byte, add it to the next byte down, add it to the next byte down, add it to the next byte down. And now, it's not like automatic, instantly you're done, but it's still way faster than going through each and every bit inside of this, this longer message. And another kind of feature here is if you have something like a sign lookup table, you don't need to store the values for all of the different sign things. Instead, you can store many of the values you care about, and then at each one of those points, you can have a point and a slope. And then you can look up anywhere in between and still get really accurate answers, even if your lookup tables aren't that big. And so really, you're looking for situations where you can either put everything in a table or put some things in a table to help break down the hardest parts of your problem. Are you guys still with me? That's the, that's the easiest one. This goes from like a, a medium talk, and if, if you guys start glossing out on the last couple slides, that's OK. Uh, I, I, I apologize in advance, but we'll just keep going with this. The next one is the idea of a naive automaton, or the Chinese room. The idea that, that this information can be stored in there, or can be put in, and other stuff can come out, but there's no intelligence. There's no, no concept of what's actually happening. So an example for this was that I used was, I was running this problem. I wanted to run a Minecraft server on a microscope slide on an AT Mega uh, uh, 168. So how do you do that? Like, that's 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 tiny. So you end up writing your own TCP stack, and that works. But then you run in, like, so you start building all these pieces. And I didn't actually look ahead. I just started building the pieces one at a time. And I ran into this thing where, oh, yeah, actually on Minecraft, if you want to be able to display any blocks, you have to first load a chunk. OK, how do you load a chunk? Well, the answer is you have to go create this entire thing, which is all of the blocks in this huge 16 by 16 by 128 area. And then you have to, like, it has to be done with Zlib compression and, and all of this other stuff. I'm like, how how am I going to do that on an, on the thing that has 512 bytes of RAM? Like this is this is <laughs> insane. Like that's not going to be like how do I how do I actually like how am I even going to do like the Zlib compression part of this? And the answer is you you don't. Instead, what you do 
is you take the messages you need and you compress them and then you glom them together and the system has no idea what any of those bytes mean, but it knows if I just deliver this to the user, the right thing happens. And so I have no idea what those bytes do. I, I, if you guys do, that would be truly impressive, but, but it, it makes no sense to me, but that's okay. Because what I actually did was I wrote four separate programs to help build the packet. I just dumped the output of all the tools into Zlibs deflate on the command line, and I didn't need to worry about anything else from there. And by the way, it totally works. You can actually run Minecraft on a microscope slide, and everything's fine. The next one, that's this is kind of bridging the gap now. So I'm sure a lot of you guys are kind of hardware leaning, right? Like, I don't know, who here is more hardware than software? Okay, then, then we're, we're, we're kind of in the right, right, right ball game now. Uh, so if you want to output to WS2012 or WS2013 LEDs, there are libraries which do it using special hardware, like, uh, as I just found out last night, a remote module on the ESP32. But the way that it was done on the 8266 and almost all hardware before that is it was done with shift registers built into the hardware. So your, your AT Mega, your AT Tiny, all of these chips have shift registers built in. And so what you can do is you can just give them these values. In this case, I have 16-bit values where the, the values, like the hardware just reads from left to right and outputs that value on the line. And so if you're trying to control like those little blinky 2812 LEDs and you see send some ones and zeros, all you do is you just look up a nibble in the table and if it's say like zero, then what you have is one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero zero zero. And so what that does is that's effectively like zero 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 zero. Yeah, and uh, then you look up the next nibble, and you can just start sending the stuff out. And this is ridiculously fast in comparison to trying to write code to figure out how to actually send that bit pattern. So the idea is the code, just no concept of any, like, what does any of that mean within the code, but it does work out to have the right output. Okay, still with me? Okay. This next one is called I don't actually know this is the name. Some people seem to call it this, but I, eh. and it's the same name that you use for other things, not just lookup tables. But any time that you you have a situation where if you're trying to find the power of like a sign and and you got like things that are going on and you have an input and output, a lot of times if you rephrase the problem or you move the operations around, you can find out that there's times where it's a lot less work. So in this case, this is something that, that I actually see in code sometimes where, where projects will have lookup tables for specific operations or functions to do specific operations when what they could do is they could just bake it all together. So instead of having to do all of this code, which by the way uses lookup tables and is reasonably fast, now we can make it much faster just by having everything all baked together. So don't get hung up on writing good reusable code here. Like, just, just don't worry about it. Don't worry about trying to make your lookup tables be something that can be truly generalized and I can use in future projects. Just recreate it. It takes like, once you get good at this, it just takes almost no time. And make purpose-built tables. Like, just, just make them exactly for what it is you need to do. And then if you want to change it, you don't like the way the LEDs are dimming or something like that, just change the table. So now we get to a project. Uh, who here has seen this project of mine? Anybody? So a couple people here? OK. Um, so that's a little ESP8266 right there. It's got Wi-Fi on it. So that's 802.11, 2.4 gigahertz. How am I going to abuse that radio to transmit to a television? This is, this is just a wire on it. It's now broadcasting a, a VHF signal to that television. I'm not going to be using the radio. I'm going to be using an I.O. port on it, and I'm going to have it hooked up to the nice little shift register built in, and I'm going to start just bit banging some bits out. But what bits do I bang out to create it? So what I did was I wrote a little JavaScript program, which, by the way, I'm a C programmer normally, but the neat thing about lookup tables is they're like truly language agnostic. Like You could write them in any language and use them in any language. And so I had this like little JavaScript program where I would actually create like a signal and the carrier for the chroma and all the weird stuff with that. And, and I would then look and see, is it greater than 0.5 or less than 0.5? So I had a little bit of a DC bias. And it would create this bit stream 
that I would transfer to the processor, and the processor kept this dictionary of colors to bitstream. So like, oh yeah, the, uh, the, the bitstream for this one defines this color, and this color, and this color, and this color, and it would just pop between them as it scanned across. And so in this case, I'm, I'm doing a couple things. So it's, um, oh, I already talked through that. Uh, uh, it uses this idea of the tome, the idea of every single timestamp or every single time base is, is now defined. What it should be outputting at that time is defined. It's naive automa uh, automaton where the code has, like, the code that just reads through this has no idea what any of these bits mean. Like, I, I wouldn't even be able to know what they mean, but, it was computed from that, that nice little JavaScript program which created those beautiful little waves, which by the way, if you look at it on like Osmocom or like one of the, the FFT viewer things, the, it does not look that good. But it's still good enough, good enough for the TV. The TV still, still did it. And uh, the process algebra. So now, second to last concept here before we get into some more examples. This is where it starts getting a little trickier. Okay, a lot trickier. Is this idea of setup soup. Um, and this is a term which I don't really know why you would call any anyway, rate, don't worry about that. It's part of a bigger one, which is the switch case syndrome thing. So the idea is you can write code to do that. But in this case, I was working on a system where I had one kilobyte between user code and like regular code on an AT Tiny 13, and it needed to be a software defined power supply and also a bootloader for the other code so you could turn the power on and off at the right times to make it boot into the bootloader and reflash it over the power. It was just weird. I don't know why I agreed to do this. Um, but the point was everything needed to be as small as possible. And you actually can do that just by doing this. You'd think, well, if I make a table, I have to interpret the table. But a lot of times you'll find that interpreting tables actually produces much smaller code than having the code to go do it in the first place. And that's just one of the options. The other one, which is, this is all part of this idea of the switch case syndrome, is that you can have a switch case that does all these different things and has some gnarly logic in there. But another way around it is, and this is in JavaScript, is just to have the functions you'd want to call in given situations in a table. And this is really kind of critical to thinking in the way that, that lookup tables can control your program's control flow. That, that lookup tables can actually like not just give you an answer from some input, but it can also kind of like change the way that your code is executed in some really kind of interested in deep ways. And now we come to the last big lookup table idea. This was unfortunately published on April 1st. I thought it would be a great idea. I told Mike Stitch about it. I was like, oh my gosh, I can do this thing. It's ridiculous. I'm going to do it on April 1st. And the joke is that it's going to be, it's not going to be a joke, except the fact that very few people thought this was real. And they were kind of right. And it was, I'm not going to do that again. Not for something this weird. Because, uh, like, there, there is no e Ethernet controller inside that chip, but you can still talk 10 base T Ethernet to it. It's, it's, it's fine. Um, and you may be thinking, how? Like you have, so I, I have this, this again, this nice little shift register that I can operate at 40 megahertz in this thing. Uh, thank you. I know only uh, 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 Sprite is here from Espressif, but thank you so much. To tell whoever put the first I squared S engine in an ESP, like if I can give them a beer or something, it's going to be. Anyway, you get this data stream coming on in, and it's coming in at 40 megabits per second, and, 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 and you have this signal, this 10 base T Ethernet signal, which, by the way, is actually 20 megahertz. There's some neat things with, like, Manchester coding and all. But in order to do 10 base T Ethernet on this ESP, to be able to hook it up to an Ethernet jack and have it work, you have to interpret the signal and figure out what bytes are actually being sent. And that's really hard. It's actually this hard. This is all of the different, so like I went through on paper and went through like, okay, if it was a one and then it's a zero, then this, and, and all of these, this just crazy, stupid logic. And this inner loop now has to execute at 40 megahertz. Like, I don't even think you can do that on like a Pentium, like, or not even a Pentium, an i5. I don't even think you can just do it at all. But, but, but. What you can do is you can frame your problem as having some value, some state that you have at your input. You're changing that. And then at the end, you know how those values changed, and you have some bits that you've read in. So this has a loop that iterates over four bits, and I change the values. So effectively, what I'm doing is 
I'm doing this sort of thing down here. By the way, Bitlooney, thank you for kind of mentioning that last night. I think this really helps. In that you have some new data that's coming into this, this lookup table, and you have outputs which feed back into the input. And that, this idea is what has made basically a lot of my crazier projects possible. And if you can phrase your problem in one of these ways, where you can write a bunch of really wild code to just go figure out how to solve the problem, you don't need to worry how fast or slow it executes, because it all executes all at once in a single lookup. So what I'll do is I'll write out what the different bits mean in, in the area. So I know that like the most significant bit is whether or not it was a one or zero is the last one. The next one down was, okay, don't even worry about that kind of stuff. The point is, I write out the table for what the inputs mean and what the outputs to my table mean. And then I can then use the table and just start feeding it data, feeding the output back into the input. And now I can do incredible amounts of processing. So this is totally definable in Verilog. I could use, I don't even know how many LUTs it would take, but it wouldn't take that many LUTs of an FPGA. But I can bake all of them all together all into a single table, and it's a single LUT that can be operated inside of just a normal processor. By the way, this also runs on an AT Tiny 85. Um, uh, you can't do a ton of stuff with it, but you can ping it, and if you ping it with the right packets, you can send it colors to send to the LEDs, and then it responds back by whether or not like the button is pressed. So it, it, it works. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, it uses exactly the same table. Um, and uh, and the, the TX also uses a lookup table uh, for, for transmitting packets, and it's the same sort of idea that you saw with the WS2812s where, where we have these, these things and it shifts from left to right and that defines how the data goes out. And by the way, the convenient thing is on the, the AVR is the, the process to go through and use this table, if you write it in assembly, is exactly eight commands. So if you're, if you're running your processor at 20 megahertz, I think, uh, it's, you know, it's seven or, no, not seven, four or eight or something like that. Point is, it just works out that like it's processor complete and you can actually send 10 base T arbitrary packets from RAM and it does all the magic stuff. <clears throat> so we're going to write a little bit of this out on paper. And so this is actually how I start thinking through this. Um, this is an example of where I was doing full speed. And this never made it to a video because I never finished the other part of it, which uh, there's a lot of projects I do that nobody's ever seen, and that's OK, and just fail, and it's fine. Um, but I, I tried doing full speed uh, USB using like software bit banging. And there's a bunch of low speed uh, USB stuff, but I, I, I thought maybe I could do it with full speed. The answer is you kind of can. Um, but what I would do is I would write out on paper. So if I see a bit transition now, if it's like two bits that I get on my input shift register, then it's, it's invalid. I know that that's bad. And so I can just write that into like a, a, a table. And if it's if it's three in a row, then that's a one 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 bit transition. If it's if it's four, it's it's also one. But if I see five, then I know that that's not really a valid thing I can see. And so I would write out all the different possibilities. One of the nice things about USB is it does this thing called bit stuffing, so it guarantees you don't have really long runs of of values, so you don't get desynchronized. But um, but what I could do is I could write all of that out on paper, and then I could kind of think about it as that table, like how would I take this thing that I've kind of written out on table and turn it into a table? And in this case, what I thought of is I was like, okay, well, I could read in eight bits at a time, and this is like sequentially, so eight bits in time, and I would need to store, it's like five bits of state is the minimum that I could figure out how to get that down to. And then on my output, I can output the number of like actual logical bits that I'm gonna be outputting the bits themselves are stored in like the next couple bits over. So if this was like zero, zero, then I don't even care about that. If it was zero, one, then that means there's one bit in here that's, that's useful. And actually, it would be over there and, and stuff like that. And the idea is this I could then turn into a table. And so uh, it, it allows you to kind of think about the whole system. Like, what are you really trying to accomplish? What are the inputs that you have to work with? What do you have to keep track of? and then you can bake it into a table. And the, the two things that are really critical here when you think about this is 
understand that the input bits are really, really valuable. So if I can figure out how to do this with one bit less of state, the size of my lookup table is now half the size. If I can figure out how to do with it with uh, uh, several less, or like if I can do, say, four bits of input at a time, my table's much smaller, like 1 16th the size. But then you have to kind of make the trade-off. Uh, so back to the, the gzip thing. So the thing that whenever you're compressing or uncompressing files, uh, there is a trade-off there. And there's a lot of research that went into what size of a table do you use before you drop back and you do it in a naive way. And the reason is, if this table gets big on a processor that uses cache, then you blow your cache all the time. And you end up back in a situation where you'd be even slower than the original like solution. So. We have these building blocks. And uh, I have two more examples here. Um, one I was going to go a lot more into, but totally shouldn't, especially considering time. And uh, yeah, so we're at this. And again, if any of you guys know the actual names for these things or want to brainstorm better names, please let me know. Let's get weird. So Olivier Bilou, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I hope I didn't just totally bodge it. Or Botch? Botch it. Um, he made this cool thing. So you guys are probably used to seeing a bunch of like computers made with 7400 series logic and like the, the mega processor out of transistors and all of that. This guy wanted the best of both. He wanted a small computer that was actually a competent computer. And uh, in fact, it was so competent that he could write a relatively high level language and it would solve the Ang Queens problem. And that's, that's literally all of that is running on this little computer right here. And the computer is made out of nothing except for ROM and this one RAM chip right here. And that's, that's how it works, is that all of the different major components are baked into the individual chips. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so what they would do for things like a, uh, an ALU, which I don't know if you guys have seen that before. An ALU takes in like two numbers, and then you might want to add them or subtract them or divide them or whatever. And then it outputs a value. And it may output things like, oh, yeah, actually, you, you skipped over when you added that and stuff like that. So instead of having all of these complicated logic circuits for, for doing that, he just baked it into an EEPROM. And again, we see the other the ROM thing there that I mentioned before. So emulators, real quick. Do you guys know how, this is Fabrice Bellard did this, how, well, okay, I, I ran it, but Fabrice Bellard wrote it, how I'm running uh, Linux 2.6 in Firefox. This is, by the way, this is an x86, a 586, or 5, 586, yeah, emulated in Firefox running on Windows 2000, which is being emulated in, on, a, on a 686 in Chrome, running on uh, my Ubuntu or Linux Mint. That's what I was using as the desktop. Uh, uh, and this was relatively performant. It only took two minutes to, to boot. And in Hello World, by the way, this is all bunk. It didn't actually take 0.23 seconds. It was a while. But like it ran Hello World in like under, I think it was like three seconds. Like It was relatively performant. Um, mind you, when you go down these like two levels, things get, or four? I don't even know. It gets a little bit more weird. Um, but guess what? You look at his code, the very first thing, lookup tables. He used it to help like do a really quick fallout to, uh, to be able to see the opcodes and how to jump into them. And uh, one neat thing, Bitlooney was just telling me he did exactly the same thing. Well, not exactly, actually. Bellard doesn't do a first, I don't remember the details, but he's doing some cool stuff with that too. I hope I didn't give anything away. Uh, but uh, this is an FPGA conference, and so let's look at at least one example, because I have two minutes left, right? That's Two? OK. Uh, so we're going to just breeze by this. And don't worry about it. I was going to go into much more detail here. I'm glad I spent more time on the rest of the talk and not this. But we're going to look at, say, an LFSR. And we actually want to output this Huffman coded pseudo random noise codes. Um, and they're used all over the place. Um, and why would you use an FPGA? Like, like it's just it's logic gates. The answer is like, duh, of course, you'd want to use an FPGA because it is just logic gates, except that you don't need one. Uh, instead. We're going to just try to do all of this on an ESP32 and see what kind of performance we have. So what I do is I start, 
And I, I copy and paste the code off, off of Wikipedia in this case, and I run it, and it runs. And I was like, cool, I checked it, the data's right, and it's 7.8 megachips per second. That was actually too low for this pro uh, project. But then I was like, okay, well, what if I think about it, and I go back to the Stanford bit twiddling hacks thing, and I use this XOR thing here. And uh, it's, it's faster. In fact, this was actually fast enough for the project, but I was like, okay, you know, I'm just going to go all out and see how fast I can make this thing. So I, I went, and I, I, I pretended I was writing assembly but I was actually writing C code, which, by the way, is a really cool thing to do if you can take code, compile it, and then look at what the assembly was. You can learn how to help the compiler write the code for you. I need, like, one more minute. Uh, uh, and then that, then that was super optimized at 23.6. But I'm like, okay, that's already faster than I need, but I'm, I'm still just going to keep going for it. Uh, so what happens if you just give up and you write a table? So you do the same thing where you take the outputs and then the way that that would shift that weird, the, the permutation, the value that, that you're kind of shifting around. And I do it for all combinations of eight bits in the lower value. And then I just use the table in a really dumb way. Like there's no optimization there. And it's already 126 megachips per second. And just because I'm a masochist, I decided to write it all in assembly just for fun. And yeah, sure, it goes up to 215. So like the answer is without effort, I was able to get a much higher performance value without anything really all that hard just by using the lookup tables. So uh, in summary, uh, these are the things that I found. You can kind of remember them by their names. Maybe. I don't know. If you have any ideas, please, again, come up and talk to me. And hopefully, this, guy, this lets you guys out there spread a little bit of the LUTs inside of all of your code to make things that may have been previously impossible now possible. Thank you. <laughs>